Good morning to each of you. And a big thanks to Diana Marie for that beautiful piece. Um, you guys play from your heart, and you just worship God when we do that, and we get to sit back and be a part of that. And we're just so blessed to have you both up here uh, as you lead us in worship this morning and the praise team as well. Good morning to everybody, um, both out online somewhere, if you're watching from online or you're in the ark or you're here. It's just a, a wonderful day to be able to get together. It's cold outside. Winter is like knocking on the door. Um, the wind and the cold, um, it's all there. I was right in, reminded this morning um, in the council room just before we came up here um, by Jeff Genzink. Uh, he reminded us that there's a lot going on. We've got some technology issues this morning and people are running around and Pastor Dan's still up in the sound booth and uh, we've got some issues going on. But um, Jeff Genzink reminded me of something this morning and reminded all of us that no matter what's going on, how busy our lives are, or what's, what's happening around us, God's still in control. And he is, as you'll hear this morning, he is our fortress, and he is our protector, and he is our strength. So I'm going to ask you this morning, I want everybody just to close your eyes for a second. Please do that. Just take a deep breath. And just let it out for a second. And open your eyes. I pray this morning as we worship, as the praise band leads us this morning, I pray that we can focus our heart and our mind, forget everything else, to leave, as Pastor Dan said last week, to leave the me outside and to come into this place with the we, to be able to worship our God. And I pray that we can do that. So let's pray as we get ready to get started. Father God, we just come to you this morning and we just say thank you. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for being our fortress and our strength. Thank you for being our hope and our peace in this crazy time with things going on and around the world. And even this morning with the busyness of trying to get worship going and everything else, Father God, let us be still. Let us know that you are our God and that you are in control of all things. We love you so very much. We pray that our hearts and minds may be able to focus on you and the work that your son Jesus Christ did on the cross for us so many years ago so that we could have a restored relationship with the creator of the universe. We give thanks and praise for that. We give thanks and praise for you. We give thanks and praise just for being able to wake up this morning to be able to come into your house and worship you. Thank you for being our big God. We love you so very much. We turn this worship over to you. We turn our lives over to you. We turn all that we are and all that we'll be over to you. We pray these things in your name or in your name alone. Amen. I'd ask everybody would rise as you're able. Today's call to worship comes from Psalm, uh, Psalm 46. These are the words of the Lord. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake in their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at the break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, and the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolation he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and the shafts and the spears, and he burns the shields with fire. He lays, he, the Lord says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted on the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Receive God's blessing as we go into worship this morning. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, who is our fortress and is our strength. Through Jesus Christ, who is our salvation and our redeemer, through the powerful work of the Holy Spirit, who gives us peace, comfort, and encourages us. And all God's people said, amen. Please join us as we begin singing, um, yeah, a mighty fortress, our God.
Father God, this morning, we come before you with humble hearts. We confess, Lord, that as human beings, we are prone to rebel against you, to try to do things our own way, to think we know best. We can go back to the very beginning, to your first children, Adam and Eve, Lord, and see how prone we are to that. Lord, it's no different, though the times and the cultures and the circumstances change. We know, Lord, it's easy for us to think that we can do it, that we are good enough in ourselves, or that, Lord, somehow our salvation depends upon us, or that we are due glory. Father, forgive us when we seek to lean on our own understanding, our own strength, rather than yours. Father, we thank you for people like Martin Luther, many uh, in that time period, Lord, who were drawn back to the message, the good news of the gospel. And that reminder that it's you who have done this through your son, Jesus Christ, that it's you who provide us salvation, that it's you through your Holy Spirit who leads us forward in a new way after your own heart. Lord, we pray again this morning that we would be reminded of that and assured of it in our lives together. Lord, help us to know without a doubt that you have worked for our salvation through your son, Jesus Christ, and that there's nothing else we could or need to add to the work he has done. And Lord, provide us too the presence and power of your Holy Spirit. Not only that we continually might be assured of this, but Lord, that we might be made after your heart, that we would not seek glory for ourselves or seek any other way for our salvation, but would trust in you and rejoice in you. Father, we trust in your grace. We put our faith in you, and we pray, Lord, that you would continue to lead us forward as your people. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Just as a word of assurance this morning, I wanted to read from Ephesians chapter 2. These are uh, familiar words to many of us, Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, but I think reminds us of what God has done for us, the grace that he has worked through his son, Jesus Christ. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ, seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God's people said, Amen. If you're able, let's stand together to sing of God's wonderful salvation, the song, Mighty to Save.
Espírito. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today with a humble heart and mind. You are the rock of our faith and the reason we are joined in this community today. We thank you that we can be worshiping you here today, gathered in this sanctuary, watching online at home or wherever we may be. You are, all the, <clears throat> you are the almighty and all-knowing. Your presence fills this room and captivates our hearts, souls, and minds. You know each and every one of our individual needs and what we are struggling with. You have given us an abundant amount of undeserved forgiveness and grace. You sit above in the heavens, watching over us each and every day, keeping us safe. This change of season is your beautiful handiwork, and we praise you for that. Your fingerprint can be seen evidently through all that you do. King of kings, for you were, for where all of our hearts, you know where all of our hearts lay at this very moment. You know our sinful thoughts, actions, and desires. We come before your almighty presence in awe to confess and lay down our burdens at the foot of the cross. We have betrayed you for walking blindly on our own path, not clearly our way. We pray now, Lord, that you take those sins from us where we know we have wronged you and don't deserve your unconditional love. Let your forgiveness fill us as we are sinful people. Lord, we pray. Lord, we thank you for your blessings that we have in life. We thank you for the changing of the seasons. We thank you that we could be, we are able to come here to worship you. We thank you that we can worship you in a free country. We thank you for the wonderful congregation that we have here. We thank, we thank you for the support that they have given the young people. We think of the auction that we just had and the support that the congregation gave to that. We thank you for gathering with family later this month for Thanksgiving. We thank you for the technology that we have so people can watch online from home. We thank you for the doctors and nurses in the hospitals and all the time that they are giving to sick patients. We thank you for your grace. We thank, Lord, we love you and we thank you for everything. Lord, we also think of the people who are hurting in this time, the people who are dealing with COVID and might be home alone or in the hospital. We thank you. We think of the people who have family members that have COVID and they can't see their family. Lord, we think of Cal and Joyce in this time as Joyce is in the hospital and she is not doing well and Cal is not doing well either. Lord, we pray for this. We pray that this virus goes away and life can get back to normal. Lord, we pray that all the healthcare workers stay safe and stay healthy. We think of people who have cancer and please heal their bodies. We think of the families that have lost a member of their family as they are grieving at this time. We also think of our election coming up this week. Help the leaders of our government to follow what you want them to do. Lord, we pray for the students as they might be online, at home, or in school. We pray, we pray for their safety. We pray for everybody who is traveling, help them to be safe. Lord, we also pray for the people in different countries that cannot worship you freely because of persecution. We pray for the soldiers that are fighting for our country, help them to stay safe and come back to their families safe. Lord, we pray for the missionaries right now as it might be hard in this time of COVID. Lord, we pray for the summer trips for the youth group, help all the plans to be figured out. Lord, be, be with us in this time of worship. Let your word speak through Pastor Dan this morning and bring us and him bringing us your word. In your name we pray, amen.
invite you to please turn with me this morning in your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. We're going to end up reading most of this chapter together, but really kind of beginning and focusing on the first 10 verses. But after we read that, I encourage you to keep your Bibles open because not only will we be reflecting on those words, we're going to return back to read some of the stories that follow the Spirit's leading of God's missionaries into Europe, into Greece, as we'll see this morning. As you're turning to that uh, passage in Scripture at this moment, uh, just a, a quick follow-up to last week. Now, we talked last week together about how the church thrives when we realize it's not all about me, and not even just all about us or uh, a group of us together, but about what God's doing in His church overall. And a lot of conversations and follow-ups, uh, emails with, with you over the course of the last week. And uh, uh, as I had those conversations and a lot of you saying that that resonated with you and sharing stories about you know, how you've either struggled with that or been trying to do that in your own life, I realize, as I'm getting to know you a lot better now after almost two years, that I was talking to people who have quite a bit of variety in themselves, uh, people on different ends of the political spectrum or different experiences in their lives. And as I reflected on that, what became clear to me is not that, uh, boy, last week was such a great sermon or something like that, but rather that there's a desire for this in our church, in this community here at Friendship, that we see that God is calling us to something, a uh, witness that is different from what we're seeing in the divisiveness of this world. I thought, oh, that's a really good thing. It's a good desire for us to have that. And then I thought to myself, well, what makes that happen? Right? Is it enough that we just want this, that we want to be united in Christ and show a different picture to the world? Does that make it happen? And I thought as we were looking at uh, Reformation Day this weekend, I thought, well, no, it's not what we, be what we believe. Right? We need God to lead us and empower us for that reality. And then I thought, what a fitting thing. We were in Acts 15 last week and seeing that a division in the church, the possibility for division, how the Spirit led over that. And then as we come to chapter 16, we see the Spirit very prominently up front leading God's church. And I thought, boy, if we're going to go forward together, being united as God's people, showing that it's not just about me, it's about what Christ is doing in all of us, we need God's Spirit to lead. And so as we think again about how the church thrives in the midst of challenging times, we're reminded again today how the church thrives as we are led and empowered by the Holy Spirit, led, of course, to Christ, as we'll see. As we're thinking about that today, just two questions I want to have in mind. And that is, how does the Spirit lead, first of all? How does He lead His church? What are the ways He does that? And then secondly, following after that, what does the Spirit lead to? And it's one thing to say, oh, the Spirit's leading us, but what does He lead to? Why should we be excited about that? And that's really where we'll enter into the, some of the stories in the text in chapter 16 which follow the very powerful leading of the spirit of Paul and his companions uh, to a place they didn't expect to go. So let's uh, dive into the text together. We'll first read just the first 10 verses of Acts chapter 16. And this is the word of the Lord. He came to Derbe and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewess and a believer, and whose father was a Greek. The brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey. So he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. Now Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mycenae, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mycenae and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So again, thinking together this morning about how the church thrives as the Spirit leads us and we follow His lead. And then these specific questions, well, how does the Spirit lead and what does the Spirit lead to? So let's think of a couple ways we see in these opening verses we just read how the Spirit leads. And this is what I want to think about first together. The Spirit leads unstoppably. When the Spirit leads, when He's at work, it cannot be stopped. There is nothing that can deter the leading and work of the Spirit. And really, this word comes even before the text we read together this morning. If you have your Bible open, you look back to chapter 15. 
We didn't read or reflect on these verses last week, right? There's this council in Jerusalem, and they reach this decision. The Spirit leads in that. And Paul and Barnabas get ready to go back out and deliver that and continue to preach the good news. But then disaster strikes. Paul and Barnabas have a dispute, a disagreement amongst themselves. On their last missionary journey, Mark had been with them for a time, but then had left. Paul saw this as a, an abandonment. And he says, I'm not going to go if Mark's going with us. I don't want him to come with us. And Barnabas says, no, I want him to go. And they go their separate ways. As we look at things from a human perspective, we say, this is a disaster. This is a potential downfall for this new church, this new movement that's going out throughout the world. Here's the two chief missionaries out to the Gentiles, Paul and Barnabas, and now they're splitting. But the Spirit's leading and work cannot be stopped. And so it seems like a disaster turns out to be, well, instead of one missionary team going out, there's going to be two. As Barnabas takes Mark and they go out to spread the good news of Jesus, and Paul then goes with Silas to spread the good news of Jesus. And as I was thinking about this from my own life and in the time we're living right now, I was comforted to be reminded that, yes, the Spirit cannot be stopped. There are forces in this world which would seek to oppose. There are things going on which seem for all the world that they're going to deter the message of the church and the work of God in this world. But friends, we are assured again that there's nothing that can stop the leading and work and power of the Spirit because this is God's plan and it is His work. And so as we think about how the Spirit leads, first and foremost, we're reminded He leads unstoppably. Secondly, as we come into the text we were reading today, we see that the Spirit leads wisely and timely. He leads in a very wise and timely fashion. Right, so Paul and Silas are going, and they're returning to some places they've been, um, what we call modern-day Turkey. And they're going there, and they come to the city of, of Lystra, where there's a disciple named Timothy, we're told. Pastor Tim, a couple of weeks ago, when we were in chapter 14, uh, had us thinking with him about how Timothy might have been there when Paul was in these cities before, and probably saw and heard Paul speaking about Jesus Christ, and heard and saw Paul being taken outside to be stoned, and how he returned back in boldly to continue preaching the good news. And now we see Timothy on the scene, this young man who everybody speaks highly of, who has a unique background. He is half Jewish on his mother's side and half Greek on his father's side. Now it seems like, oh, okay, that's an interesting note. But think with me about how the Spirit is at work and leading him. Chapter 15, where we just were last week, what's the big conflict? How are Jewish believers and Gentile believers going to have fellowship together? How are we going to get along? We come from different backgrounds, different cultures, and they work this out. They have all this discussion, but it's, it's still a challenging thing. Paul and Barnabas and Silas, they're all going out to deliver these decisions as we hear to talk about how we can live together. And who does God provide? Who does the Spirit lead them to in this conflict with Jewish and Gentile believers? Why wouldn't you know it? It happens to be Timothy, who himself is half Jewish and half Gentile. The Spirit always leads in a wise and timely manner. Just the right person for the right time. And Paul recognizes and says, we need to bring Timothy with. Not only is he a godly man, everybody speaks well of him, but he's obviously the man that God has raised up for this time and this journey we are on together. God's wisdom and the Spirit's wisdom is also seen in what Paul does next. Right? Because Paul has Timothy circumcised. And from the outside, we might say, come on, Paul, you're going back on what you've been preaching. You've been among the Gentiles and saying some of these laws and ceremonies, they aren't necessary for salvation. Paul's not going back on that here. He's being led by the Spirit in wisdom. He's being led in much the same way James was in chapter 15 when he said, let's not make it difficult for the Gentiles to receive the message of Jesus Christ. And Paul here on the other side is saying, let's not make it impossible or difficult for Jewish believers to come to know Jesus Christ. What he's saying here is, I don't want Timothy's identity, half Jewish, half Greek, well, what is he? To stand in the way of people receiving and living out the good news of Jesus Christ. And again, we're seeing the Spirit's wisdom and timeliness at work to bring that about. And so as Paul and Silas and now Timothy go out, they travel and they're delivering this message from the church in Jerusalem. It is received. And the churches are strengthened we're told in verse 5, and they're growing daily in their number because we're seeing the wisdom and timeliness of the Spirit. And again, as I was reflecting on that for us and thinking about how the Spirit leads still today, 
still true, right? The Spirit is always wise. This is God we're talking about. He's always timely. His timing is always right. And I thought to myself, well, I'm always prone to go to my own wisdom, right? Scripture recognizes that again and again. I'll seek my own wisdom, my own understanding. I'll go by my own timing, what I think looks good. But often we know how that will blow up on us. What we think is wise is not. What we think is the right time isn't. That's not the case with the Spirit. He always leads in a wisely and timely way. And then this as well, how does the Spirit lead? The Spirit leads in a variety of ways. We might have in our heads just a particular way the Spirit leads, maybe some sort of mystical peace that, that He works and speaks to us, but we're seeing even in the text the Spirit leads in a variety of ways. All right, so Paul and Silas and Timothy are out, and Luke, of course, will join them too as we hear he starts writing we. But they're going, and they're, they're in again, uh, this modern-day Turkey. And they seem to have this plan to go to the province of Asia, which isn't Asia as maybe you and I think of it. We might think of going east toward China. This is more still in the region of Turkey. It was a, a Roman province at that time called Asia. But we're told that the Spirit keeps them from that, forbids them from going there. We're not told how they realize that. Then they go on. They go past Mycenae. They want to go to this region of Bithynia. But again, the Spirit of Jesus, we're told, doesn't allow it. And then Paul has this vision. He has this vision he receives of a man of Macedonia from Greece going across the sea into what we would call Europe, saying, come, come to us, preach to us, help us, save us. And then Luke writes, we concluded at that point that we needed to go across the sea to Macedonia to preach God's word. It's one of the more powerful sections I know of in Scripture of seeing how the Spirit is leading and particularly leading his missionaries to where they need to go according to God's plan. But we're seeing as well a variety of ways in which the Spirit does this. Again, we're not given all the details here. The one we are given details on is this vision or dream that Paul had. And again, I know I might think that, well, if the Spirit's leading me, that's how it is. It's this kind of mystical way. There's a dream or a vision or there's this kind of parting of the clouds moment in some way where we receive the leading of the Spirit. And certainly, that is a way that the Spirit will lead us individually or us as a church. And I hope that maybe you could think back in your life and even see a way that the Spirit has led you in that kind of fashion. However, it's not the only way the Spirit leads. In fact, we're hearing in this passage really how God's people see the Spirit leading everywhere in all kinds of different things. So reflect with me how the Spirit can lead in our lives. The Spirit could lead through conversations you might have with another believer, or a, a book you're reading that's written by a believer, or certainly, of course, as we're interacting with Scripture. Perhaps you know of a time when someone was talking to you and a word just hit you. It kind of led you in a direction maybe you weren't going before. But I had to think about this differently. I had to do this differently. We would say that's the Spirit's leading. Certainly the Spirit also leads through circumstances of this world. We could picture maybe uh, Paul and Silas and Timothy thinking, hey, we're going to go up to Asia, and then maybe there were circumstances. Maybe somebody fell ill. Maybe there was something going on in that region. They said, it's just, it's not the time to go there. We don't know for sure. But the Spirit leads us through circumstances as well. In your lives at times, sometimes something comes up, and there might be a variety of things. You say, no, that's not where I need to go right now. That's not what I need to do. It's this. We would say again, that's not just chance. That's the Spirit's leading. It can even happen through what we might call common sense, right? Just the way that God has created our minds to think and to process things, right? Again, we don't know, but you can imagine, right? In, in the region of Turkey, it's a mountainous region. Uh, we're going to go up to Asia, but then, boy, there's a season of rain that comes. There's flood, there's slides. It's not the time to go up there. Jesus is saying, we need to go somewhere else. We would call that just common sense. You're not going to hurdle your way into that, but that's true in our lives as well. That might be a situation you look at and see and just say, no, it's, this isn't right. We need to go over here. And again, what we're being encouraged to here is not to follow like our own leading. Oh, I figured that out. I, I worked it out. But no, even that is the Spirit's leading. And it's how the Spirit would lead us in the life of the church. The Spirit leads in a variety of ways. So as we think about how the Spirit would lead you and I as, as followers of Jesus, how he would lead us as a church, we can be reminded he leads unstoppably. Right? His leading cannot be turned around. We can be reminded that he leads us in a variety of ways. We can be reminded he leads in a wisely and timely fashion. 
But I want to just think together for a moment before we switch gears and think about what he leads us to. To ask the question, are we listening to the Spirit? Or maybe another way of asking that, do we expect Him to be leading us in our lives, in our life together? Again, some of us might just think, oh, there's this one powerful kind of cloud-opening moment. But do we think like Luke as he writes here? That in all these things, the Spirit is leading. And we're following His guidance, His timelines, His wisdom. Are we listening? In prayer, in the Word, are we talking about the Spirit's leading as we converse together as God's people? And then I think it's just good, and I encourage you this morning, this week, to be thinking, how have you heard, seen the Spirit's leading in your life? How have we seen that together? I think as a, a church here at Friendship, one way I saw that, even in my process for coming here, was within the pastoral calls that you extended to myself and to Pastor Tim. Very intentionally, you as a body set apart to say, we need to listen to the Spirit. We need to take our time. We're even going to do a different process so that we can be sure it's not about us, it's about Him. We trust His leading, His wisdom, His timing. And as I experienced that on the other side too, we could see the ways that the Spirit was leading in a variety of fashions to call us together in His wisdom and His timing. How have you seen that in your life? Is there things you could write down, you can note and say, I've seen God work this. And maybe at the time I didn't realize how wise or timely it was, but boy, I can see it now. A thriving church is one that knows the Spirit is leading us and is looking for the ways He's leading us and knows how He would do so in our lives. Well, it's important to see, of course, that the Spirit is leading and how He leads. But it's equally important to discern what He would lead us to. I mean, why follow the Spirit's leading? Where is He taking us? What does he lead us to? In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul writes that the Lord is spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I believe as we're going to go now to the rest of this chapter and the stories we see, that we will see together how the spirit of God leads to freedom in Christ. To freedom in Christ. This is a powerful, potent word, certainly in our culture, and certainly right now in this time. Freedom. It's something we celebrate in this country. Where we rejoice at having a lot of freedoms that other people in the world maybe don't know or other times have not known. And while we talk about uh, not being afraid of a lot of other things in our lives, in our conversations, there still is a lot of fear about losing some of these freedoms. It tells me a couple of things. One, that we realize just how fragile our freedoms are in this world and even in our country, how quickly they can be lost or restrained or whatever you would call it. Then as I thought about it this week, and it led to this leading of the Spirit, it reminded me of how much we need to be assured of who we are and what we have in Jesus Christ. The freedom that cannot be taken away, cannot be removed, cannot be changed. And that's what the Spirit leads us to. A powerful freedom that rises above all of this. So let's continue to read together the story in Acts 16, because the Spirit leads. Go to Europe. Go to Macedonia. Well, what happens when they get there? Let's keep reading in verse 11, the story of Lydia. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, and the next day on to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there for several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. So here we get this first encounter with this group in prayer and specifically with this wealthy worshiper of God, Lydia. And we see, I think, first of all, how the Spirit of Christ oops, <laughs> leads to a different kind of freedom. Let's see if we can get back to that in a moment. But the freedom here is a freedom to be ourselves. A freedom to be ourselves. Lydia has th certain gifts that she has. I think clearly in this text it comes through that she has a gift for hospitality. But you know in this world there's always things that divide us. There's barriers that have gone up between us because of our sin. 
But Jesus Christ, of course, is always breaking those down. And the Spirit leads us to see how Jesus would break those down. So as Lydia comes to know the Lord, as she receives the good news that Paul preaches there, she is now free to be herself in a way she hasn't been before. And I think you can feel that when she invites the apostles, the missionaries, to come stay at her house. And you can feel some of the hesitation when Luke writes, she persuaded them. Because in that culture, it wasn't just normal for a woman to say to a group of men, hey, come stay at my house. There's a lot of cultural baggage that would go with that. I think we'd still say there might be some baggage today. And yet, as they're talking about who they are in the Lord, as they see Lydia coming to that faith, she is able, in a different way, to show hospitality, to share covenant, to share unity with this group of male missionaries. She is free to be her true self. Those barriers are breaking down. And I think about, first and foremost, the freedom that we receive in Jesus Christ as God leads us to that in the Spirit. I think about for you and I. And it's such a struggle to be who we are because we're always pushed on every side. And yet Jesus tells us, you are my children who I have gone to the cross to save and to redeem. For freedom Christ has set us free, that we might live as his children. We are free to be who God made us to be. The stories continue in Philippi. Let's keep reading there, verse 16. Once, Luke writes, when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or to practice. So now we're introduced to another set of carriers, this characters, the slave girl and her owners. And in her we're seeing how Jesus Christ, through the leading of the Spirit, brings us freedom from the masters of this world. And there's many kind of masters that would seek to enslave us and rule us in this world. Of course, all led by the ruler of this world, the evil one himself. We see this with the slave girl who clearly is enslaved, not just by title, but by what's going on in her life. She is owned by these masters who are using and taking advantage of her for money, and perhaps in other ways too. She is enslaved by the spirit which causes her to speak in ways that she can't hardly control. But what happens when the Spirit leads God's people to town? When Jesus, as it were, comes to town through the work and the speaking of Paul and these other apostles? She is free. The Spirit leaves her at the moment Paul calls in the name of Jesus for it to go. And you can see quickly the turnaround with her owners, how they realize that their control has been lost. We see in the slave girl this freedom from the spirits of this world, this freedom from the shackles, even though she's still a peasant, even though she still probably doesn't have much, she has a new freedom. On the other hand, we see these slave owners, these ones who seem to be in control, who seem to have the power. They're not enslaved, they're wealthy, they're rich. They have slaves of their own. And yet we quickly see how they continue to be enslaved. Because once this power, this fortune-telling power of the slave girl is removed, they say, how are we going to make money? They're slaves to the system. They're slaves to the economics. They're slaves to their pocketbook. And so they have to drum up a charge against Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke to try and get things back to the way it was. There's a thought for my life, too, in the freedom that Jesus affords us. It's a freedom from the masters of this world. We don't need to be enslaved to our pocketbooks. We don't need to be enslaved to keeping up with the Joneses. Certainly, we don't need to be enslaved to the, the ruler of this world. Because we know he's not in charge. But Jesus is. And as we see in this passage, his authority clearly drives out the evil one. Knowing Jesus means we don't have to be enslaved to anything else in this world. Let's keep reading then. The powerful concluding story. Verse 22. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates, ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon re receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. 
The other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up. When he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword, was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him, to all the others in the house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house, set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. It's a powerful concluding story as we see how the Spirit led Paul and his companions to Philippi, to Macedonia. We're seeing Paul and Silas and the jailer. We're seeing how in Jesus Christ, through the leading of the Spirit, we receive freedom to serve Jesus as Lord everywhere and at any time. So again, think with me briefly about the contrast in the story. Paul and Silas are beaten, are dragged away, are chained to the wall, probably chained to each other. They couldn't be more enslaved, couldn't be any more less free. And yet, there they are, chained to the wall, chained to each other, singing praises to God and praying to him. Luke's word just gives us a glimpse into the scene, and the other prisoners are listening. But you can imagine their thinking. What do these guys have? What do they have that they could be acting this way, chained to that wall? And again, the contrast comes in the jailer who seems to be in control. He's got the sword. He's got the keys. He's got the power. He's free, right? Well, no. Because when that earthquake strikes and the walls shake and the doors fly open and the chains fall off, what a powerful image. That jailer has grabbed that sword and is ready to take his own life. Because he doesn't know Jesus. He's not free. He's enslaved to his rulers. He's a slave to the authorities. He's enslaved to how things work. I might as well just end it because I know where this is going. But in that moment, Paul calls out, we're still here. Don't harm yourself. And you can feel, right, again, this jailer saying, what do these guys have? What do you have? He comes to them. He calls them out. Sirs, how must I be saved? How can I have what you have? And Paul says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will be saved, you and your household. And they go deeper into the word about Jesus came down from heaven, the very Son of God, has gone to the cross to forgive all of our sins, has overcome sin and death through his resurrection, and has ascended to God's right hand, who is the ruler of all things. He's come to free you from these chains, just as he freed us now. He's come to give you the heart where you can praise him as Lord, anywhere and everywhere. That jailer received that good news, he and his whole household. And even though he's still subject to the authorities, we don't know how the message goes for him going forward and what his life was like as a Roman and as a soldier, as a jailkeeper. But we know, because we hear it even in the text, that he has a newfound freedom led by the Spirit to Jesus Christ. Because he is baptized, he has joy. He's part of a different community. So yes, it's important for us to see how the Spirit is leading, but also to see what the Spirit leads us to. The Spirit leads us to the freedom that Jesus can only give, a freedom that can never be taken away. It's a conversation Jesus has with a group of people who are pretty sure of their standing, of the freedom they have because of where they came from. It happens in John chapter 8. And Jesus is teaching, he says, if you follow my teaching, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. He kind of looked at each other and said, we're not enslaved to anybody. We're children of Abraham. We have all the freedom we'll ever need. And Jesus says, everyone who sins, and that's all of you, it's all of us, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. You might think you're free, but you're not. But then Jesus goes on to say, but those who the Son sets free will be free indeed. And when you know Jesus Christ, when the Spirit is at work leading us to him and to that good news of what Jesus has done, we know a freedom that can never be taken away. We know a freedom that rises above everything else in this world because we know that we are God's children in Jesus Christ, not because of what we have done, 
or any worth we have on our own, but because of what Jesus Christ has done. As we're coming up to Tuesday, I know there's a selection that's going to be happening. And as we're talking about it, we say this is an important election. Maybe it's the most important election ever. But I was reminded this week as we talked about Reformation and all of those things, that there's an election that's already taken place that is more important than any that will ever come after it. And that is the election of God in choosing you to be his children in Jesus Christ. To say, I have come down from heaven. I have gone to the cross. I have overcome the grave. I rule over all things so that you can know true freedom, so that you can be my children. And friends, I just invite us today and going forward to continue to take a hold of that, to be assured of who we are in Jesus Christ. And no matter what's going on in this country, no matter what's going on in this world that might cause us to fret or dismay, to be reminded and come back again and again to knowing that whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And as the Spirit leads us forward to thrive in the church, he always leads us again and again to that Son of God, Jesus Christ, so that we can know that in him we have the true power of God and freedom of God as part of who we are. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let's join in prayer. Father, we thank you again this morning for your word, for the reminders of how all throughout history you have been at work, how you continue to be at work, how you lead us through your Holy Spirit to your Son, Jesus Christ, and to know the power and life and freedom that you give in him. Lord, keep us being led by your Spirit. Keep us looking for his leading and rejoicing when we see it. Keep us knowing again and again that in Jesus Christ we are your children. And there is nothing in this world that can take that away. As we live in these days that you have called us to, that you have made us for, help us, Lord, as your children, in that assurance, to give witness to your continued work in this world. Help us to see the ways the Spirit is leading and to rejoice at the opportunities to speak the good news of Jesus in this community and around the world. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. As you're able, I invite you to stand together. We're going to respond in song. The song is Who You Say I Am. We chose this one particularly coming out of our message today because it contains that word from John 8. Who the sun sets free will be free indeed. Let's join together in song.
we close our time of worship together this morning, just a couple of announcements or reminders. One is that uh, there will be no adult forum this morning for those of you who are planning on that. Uh, we won't be having that this morning. We'll pick it back up again in two weeks, November 15th. So look forward to that. Be starting a new series in our adult forum, but not meeting this morning after our worship service. The other announcement is that uh, tonight we are offering another time of worship at 5 p.m. Familiar time for many of us, but it's been a while uh, that we've been able to come together in that fashion. So I invite you, if you're willing and able, to come back with us tonight for a time of worship at 5 p.m. As we go from this place, we get to go again with the words of God's love and blessing, the promise of his presence to go with us as we go out to this day and this week. Please receive the word of God's blessing. May the God of all peace himself give you his peace in all times and in every way. Amen. Be thou my vision. Let's sing together. Mm -hmm.